It has an embedded linear circuit simulator that allows you to combine results from multiple analyses, delivering high accuracy of electromagnetics with the speed and accuracy and capacity of circuit simulation. High-speed memory and Ceres channels are easily analyzed by cascading transmission lines, connectors, printed circuit boards, sockets, and IC package interconnects. Going further, HFSS can deliver high-performance DC and transient circuit analysis, IBIS AMI modeling, statistical I analysis, synopsis HSPI simulation support, and 3D transient field visualization. For RF and microwave, HFSS is used to calculate antenna radiation, radar cross-section, microwave circuits and parasitics, biomedical simulations, and more. The 3D modeler is used for full 3D geometries, and the 3D layout editor is used for planar microwave circuits. HSS can be coupled with ANSYS thermal, mechanical, and fluid dynamic simulators, providing a complete bi-directional multi-physics solution. The embedded linear circuit simulator allows multiple electromagnetics results to be cascaded into larger systems, useful for antenna feed networks, microwave circuits, matching networks, wireless radio channels, and many other RF applications. Going further, HFSS delivers harmonic balance for nonlinear microwave circuits, filter synthesis, oscillator, load pull, and envelope circuit analysis. Rely on ANSYS HFSS for rigorous and reliable 3D full wave electromagnetic field simulation. Hi, good morning, everyone. I hope I am audible. Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, good morning, everyone. So we start uh, day four, with, uh, sorry, day three of the uh, conference with the morning keynote session. Again, we can see that there is an array of speakers. Uh, they are going to be talking to us for the next uh, couple of hours. And uh, to begin with, we thank our uh, sponsors, uh, that is ANSYS, Platinum Sponsor, NPL, our annual sponsor, and IEEE Humanitarian Activity Committee for supporting this conference. And uh, uh, I'm Chandrakhant, I welcome the speaker of the day and uh, I'll introduce the speaker. We'll start after that. So, uh, to introduce our first speaker, uh, Shupavandi Avi received her uh, BS degree from computer science uh, in computer science from Mahidol University in 1993. She received her MS and PhD degree in electrical engineering from the University of Washington, Seattle, USA in 1996 and 2001, respectively. She joined Chola. Chola from University in uh, June 2001. She is an associate professor at the Department of Electrical Engineering with a specialization in video technology. He has successfully advised nine PhDs, 27 masters, and 32 bachelor's graduate. He published over papers in international conference, proceedings, and journals, and with four international book chapters. He has rich project management experience as the project leader, leader 
and former technical committee chairs to the Thailand government bodies in telecommunication and ICT. She is very active in the international arena of the leadership position in the international network such as such as JICA project for AUN SWD net and the pro professional organizations such as IEEE, IEIC, AP, SIPA and ITU. She is currently a member of IEEE Educational uh, uh, Activities Board, organized uh, EAB and chair IEEE EAB Section Education Outreach Committee. She is also a member of Board of Governors of IEEE Consumer Electronic Society Communication and Communication Chair IEEE Humanitarian Activities Committee, IEEE New Initiative Committee and, and uh, Committee Member. She also chairs Region 10 Section uh, and Chapter Activity Committee. Uh, okay, chapter and the candidate and she is a candidate for 2022 region. She formally led the educa uh, educational activities and women in engineering in IEEE Asia Pacific, that is Region 10. Region. Uh, region 10 from 2011 to 2016. So I invite her to speak, uh, talk about her position uh, today's keynote address. Uh, super with Uh, ma'am, uh, sorry, actually you are speaking on mute. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, now we can hear you. All good? Yeah, please. Is it okay now? Okay. Yes. So I, okay. okay, so as, as I was uh, introduced as a candidate for 2021 to 2022, uh, Region 10 Director-elect, so I would like to also make a note that uh, we have three other candidates. Uh, first is uh, uh, Professor Lance Fung. I think he gave uh, a keynote yesterday. He's from Murdoch University, Australia. And then we have uh, Professor Nolisa Moore. Uh, so she is from University of Technology, Malaysia. And uh, she also gave a talk later. And also uh, Professor Shelia Sanas. She also from Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology. And she gave uh, a keynote in this session as well. So today my talk is about uh, video anomaly detection for intelligent surveillance system. And I am from Electrical Engineering Department of Jualongkorn University. And uh, Jualongkorn University is the oldest and most prestigious university in Thailand. We already uh, in past uh, 100 years. Uh, we are the public and autonomous research university. We rank number one in Thailand for seven consecutive years. And recently, uh, we have been included in the 96th rank of the world top university for academic reputation uh, for the QS World Ranking 2021. So you can see uh, the statistic, uh, we are big and comprehensive universities. And they already uh, been introduced me and active in, in, in many uh, area uh, for teaching, for research, uh, for uh, academic service, and also for the IEEE tasks as well for the position that I already mentioned uh, I won MG Leadership Award uh, last year. Uh, yeah, so I just come to my talk because we, we have a uh, very limited time. So I was, uh, would like to start first about research, uh, which is a distance between idea and its realization. And when, when we start doing research, we start with some idea, right? And then mainly if you are a student, you, your realization would be you would like to publish in the good conference proceeding or from a journal. And if we add the long term research, we may would like as well uh, to build a, a practical application to be a product and then to find a patent. Right. So realization can be many things. Right. But uh, if we work more year on the research, then the idea and its realization would, I mean, become shorter and shorter. OK, so I, I hope that you could will research in this and uh, try to uh, make this distance shorter and then, I mean, we can right away, we can make a state of the art of the work. 
And this quote is from David Sandoff. Uh, he is a father of the, the, the US televisions. So today my talk uh, is anomaly detection. So it's a part of the video analytic uh, for the surveillance system. And today we all know that artificial intelligence uh, play a lot of roles. So today I will explain about the, the machine learning and deep learning that used in our research. We have so many CCTV camera today. And then what happened is that uh, how can we extract the useful information so that we could give a uh, useful warning, right? Or, or mainly extract so that we could some useful some information for the marketing purpose, for the strategic planning purpose. So intelligent video analytic uh, is needed. So I have uh, first doing research uh, 15 years ago, we got the funding from the government. So the video analytic uh, could be uh, at that time is mainly like a pixel or image processing. So there is no deep learning at that time. So we have this uh, person detection and tracking, super resolution, uh, feature extraction and face cataloging. Okay. And then uh, we can have the monitoring and warning, right? So mainly like if there are some species uh, even on the scene, how can we detect it? So the, the, the method before would be more of some kind of the rule base, right? So it's mainly it's, it's going to work from certain scenario. Then you have to adapt the rule again to make from another scenario. But mainly today we, we, we're going to talk about the anomaly detection. Right, so that I mean, it, it could handle more uh, detection in uh, several scenario, and then we also do the person tracking to the multiple cooperative camera. Uh, so mainly, if we have many camera, how can the camera talk to each other? How can the camera, if they detect something suspicious in the in the first floor, for example, then how can it send information to the third camera, and then I mean detect something, but. I mean, this area is still very challenging. So mainly that that is the, the, the generic feature of the video analytic. And then uh, today with the evolution of the, the powerful CPU, GPU, and all the cloud server, now it's now possible right, for the artificial intelligence to, to, to play the role in here. So as we know, artificial intelligence is more of like, we, we would like to mimic the, the human intelligence uh, so that it could think like a human, it could make a reasoning like a human. Right? So that mainly how can we, we I mean, use that if, if we can uh, classify person, we can recognize person. So it means the, the robot now uh, something like that can do that. It can also even can drive like it's autonomous car, for example. Right. So so mainly the subset of the the uh, AI is machine learning. Okay, so mainly is this is uh, straight on the concept that if we learn something for a long time, and if we can learn from a lot of data set, then we can use the statistical technique, okay, so that we could improve the performance uh, as times go by. And the subset of the machine learning is the deep learning uh, that we focus more on building multi-layer uh, neural network that's similar to how the neuron of our brain work. Right, so it's when it able to train itself also to performing tasks and good at the classification or the recognition tasks. So I have done the research in the several area, but of course today I will uh, focus only on anomaly detection in the video scene. So how we could uh, train the machine learning model, right? So I just want to give the example for the, like a classification problem. Like, so here we, we need the, uh, a large, I mean, the data set as many as possible. Like uh, for this one, if we want to classify cat from dog, so you need uh, a lot of the data set. I mean, with contain many image uh, on variety of uh, posts and different type of the cat and dog as well. And then it has to go to the training, right? So, I mean, in the training, you're gonna use training data set and also with, I mean, the, the, the label and then you, you mainly extract the features and then use that, I mean, for the, I mean, the machine learning algorithm. Okay, and then uh, during the training phase, we can also have the, the validation. Uh, validation phase is mean like uh, we try to test the performance and accuracy of the our existing training data and, and then see, and then somehow we can adjust uh, the, the, I mean, the parameter as well so that it could include, uh, in, increase the accuracy. 
And then in the, the testing phase, uh, which is the, the prediction phase, in this case, you can enter any image, right? And then the, the classifier would be able to classify uh, what uh, the data from the training and then give the proper label to it, okay? So uh, in, in, in total, when we do this, we need the training, we need the validation, and also we, we do the actual testing. So the, the work that I give a talk today is just published in IEEE Access uh, is a unsupervised anomaly detection and localization based on deep spatial temporal translation network. And it's published in March uh, 10 uh, this year. So actually this is the, the very I mean, uh, popular or, or like a challenging work that everyone are interested in right now. So when we talk about anomaly, it would, Define as something that deviate uh, from the standard normal or expected patterns, right? So it's mean if we take a look at uh, this video, we we could see that if we think uh, the algorithm think that the people walking is the uh, normal pattern, so anything that deviate from that, which is the the track, and then also like uh, people uh, buy uh, ride a bicycle in would consider as the anomaly. So of course, anomaly is depend. It is like subjective. It depends on how I mean you could define it. So the process of the anomaly detection would consist of the feature extraction and then the anomaly detector, and then feature extraction is is up to like you gotta use the spatial features, which has the many different what the handcraft method or the the CNN, or the temporal feature which can be optical flow or trajectory. And then anomaly detector, okay, we have the several of the popular classifier and then also in terms of the neural network. So at the end, we would like to classify whether this uh, is a normal or the an anomalous event. And then also in the anomaly detector, we need also to define how we could characterize it as a normal event or anomalous event. Okay, so in this case, we would like to characterize the, the anomalous event. So it can be both supervised, semi-supervised, or unsupervised. And in our case, we choose to work on unsupervised, so we, we do not label anything. So I mean, the algorithm have to try to learn by itself. Okay, so in which it gives more flexibility that it can uh, mainly uh, categorize uh, several of the event. So when we use unsupervised learning, then we have to review the algorithm. Mainly, of course, we didn't build anything from scratch because they're already state of the art. Uh, like a feature extractor, there are many met a good method for the spatial feature extraction, and then for the the, the temporal feature as well, right? So, so I mean, we 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 choose the method, and then also the classification as well. Okay, so we we have to analyze and see uh, which one is good to fit on our framework. Okay. So the motivation and the, the problem statement of our work is that we work on the challenges of anomaly detection to handle, I mean, the, the crowded uh, scenario. Okay, so which is the, the, the high complexity with occlusion clutter scene than the uncrowded scenario. But, but somehow some challenges is that uh, typically there are less number of abnormal even in the data set, right? So it's mean we, we have less chance to learn for variety event uh, of the, the data set. Okay, so it is useful as well to, to do the research that we could learn something from the I mean real time scenes. Okay, and another one is the object localization, like how, how can we uh, mainly get the get the, the object okay, that in, in which we later on we will classify it as the, the anomaly. Okay, there would be the localization problems. And then also to correctly detect and localize anomalous event, uh, we need to take into consideration the spatial uh, feature and both the temporal features. And as I, I mentioned before, so in the old time, right, when we would like to detect the anomaly, it, it will be more of a handcraft or, or I mean traditional based, I mean approach, uh, so that I mean we have to check uh, all the appearance or the, the motion based on the handcraft features. So this one would make it more difficult to generalize uh, to the complex scenario. And today, many uh, move to the deep learning based approach, right? So it's better in handling the complex scene. Okay? And then, I mean, also it can work on several on unsupervised uh, even and, and can improve performance of the object localizations. 
So in our work, we, we focus on the generative adversarial network. So actually, the generative adversarial network is the outstanding approach uh, to overcome data generation and then classification problem in the complex tasks. So it's good at the data augmentation on the same small data set and implicit uh, data management. Uh, so it is a very a good approach to ha uh, handle the uh, complex anomaly detector. Uh, so how how it works? So uh, actually, it consists of the generator and discriminator. So mainly for the the, the generator is uh, produce a synthetic image, uh, like for example the fake image for the random noise. <clears throat> see why the discriminator will try to differentiate between the the fake image and then the the real image, right? So mainly the goal of the generator is to generate synthesize uh, example of the object that look like the real one and at, attempt to to fool the discriminator right uh, to make a wrong decision okay so so that is uh, mainly like like the task so it's mean in term of the discriminator it already learned something from the training data set so it has to try its best right to to catch the the fool and then uh, mainly uh, make the uh, correct or differentiate between real and the fake image. So we we, we did use the the generative adversarial network. I mean in the in our work. So our proposed framework is based on the DSTN or deep uh, spatial temporal uh, network. Uh, so mainly uh, we we our DSTN is based on GAN, right? So the main component would be the DSTN, uh, the feature collection, the spatial temporal translation, a uh, differentiation, and then the edge wrapping, right? So first, well, we have the the feature collection uh, is an initial process to extract the appearance of the of the object. So the feature will fit into the the I mean the model to learn the normal pattern. So in this case, the generator is used in both training and testing time and discriminator will use only in the training time. So during the, the training, uh, the generator will learn the normal pattern from the training video and then it understand and has a knowledge of what the normal pattern look like. So the reason that why we feed uh, only the, the frame of the normal pattern is that we need the model to be flexible and able to, I mean, uh, handle uh, all possible of the anomaly events in the real world without the label that it is an anomaly. <clears throat> so specifically, we will input the normal event of the, I mean, original frame F with the background removal frame and into the generator, which uh, contain the encoder and the decoder to generate the dense uh, optical flow. And then after fields, we get the 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 fields uh, dense optical flow, and which is the uh, one of the the patch uh, that we I mean consider to input into the I mean the generator. Okay. So to obtain a good optical flow, I mean uh, we 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 do this, and then this give the uh, great information, right? And after that, the patch are concatenated to the generator to produce the patch that I mean. Uh, so that it will has a two input into the discriminator and then it will try to uh, differentiate whether the, this is the fake or real. And then uh, after that, uh, we have the uh, testing. So in terms of the, the testing, <clears throat> which is due after the training, right? The, the STN model with, it will understand the mapping of apparent representation of the normal event to its corresponding dense optical flow, which is uh, represent the, the motion representation. And then all parameters used in training are uh, used also in testing, right? So, I mean, in the testing, all frame of the normal and abnormal event are input into the, the, the generator G, and it's try to reconstruct the apparent and motion representation uh, from the learned normal event. But however, we have to note that the generator G has not learned any abnormal uh, sample. So it would be unable to reconstruct the abnormal uh, area properly. Okay, so in this case, it will give the reconstruct result by unstructured block. So we take this inability okay, to correctly reconstruct the anomalous uh, event in order to detect the anomaly. So therefore, we would find the, the differentiation by subtracting 
the pixel in the local area between the synthesized image and then with the real uh, image. And in, in, and in, in addition, not only anomaly detection is uh, important for the real world use, but also for the anomaly localization. So we also propose the edge wrapping, uh, I mean, in the final stage. So mainly it could uh, have the precise edge of the abnormal object, okay. <clears throat> So the evaluation criteria, uh, we use the, the standard UCSD data set. Uh, we will evaluate on the frame level and then on the, I mean, on the pixel level. Okay, so from the frame level, we check the uh, the performance of the abnormal event, uh, whether abnormal event is detected or no matter what size and location. But in the pixel level, the object detection uh, will be uh, correctly localized. And we use these uh, several data set, uh, UCSD, which is a pedestrian, so like uh, people walking and some of the truck or the, the bicycle come in. And then we are use the MN, UMN data set. Okay, it has a video of the different indoor and outdoor scene. And we use the Avenue data set, uh, which has uh, uh, mainly like the people with the different kind of the actions. Uh, so the implementation detail with <clears throat> training using the NVIDIA uh, GTX and also the testing with the, the, the C, I mean the CPU Intel core processor. Uh, advantage of our algorithm is that we have less time complexity. So uh, like three frame uh, per second and also the unsupervised learning, it can detect uh, several uh, anomaly even apart from the walking. And this show the, 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 I mean, the result, I don't know why it cannot be, I will keep playing. Okay, so. We have five can... more minutes. Okay, I almost finished. Yeah, so I think I will show. Yeah, so here you can see uh, the highlight would uh, consider as the anomaly, right? Here we can see the uh, abnormal crowd activities. Okay, and then if uh, uh, people jumping and, and can also detect uh, as the abnormal. And we also, I mean, show the result in terms of the, the, the receiver operating characteristic. Okay, which uh, usually we plot the false positive uh, rate uh, versus the true uh, positive rate. Okay, and then we compare our algorithm with several of the state of the art algorithm. And you can see like our algorithm uh, at the one at, at the at the top and then the left. So it means we have the best performance and outperform. We have the uh, strongest growth in terms of the true positive rate. Okay, so it's, it's proved that our proposed method is effective and robust uh, for the anomaly detection and also at the frame level and localization of the object at the pixel level. So on, on the conclusion, uh, Video anomaly detection for the crowd scene is still the challenging task in the computer vision research. Okay, due to the complex scene, small anomaly data set, time consumption, and then the object localization. So there are many ways that we can still, I mean, improve the performance uh, on the localizing of anomaly at the, the pixel level. Okay, and the uh, foul positive detection is still a major problem. Okay, so somehow we have to try to, I mean, reduce the, the power positive as much as possible. And the current trend is uh, on improving toward the performance of anomaly localization and along with the time complexity. So it can use in real time. And still we need to use the representation from both uh, spatial and then temporal to cover our possible object features. And to achieve uh, uh, effective and reliable system, future direction would uh, relate to the pre or post analysis process and multi-model object detection uh, using anomaly or uh, supervised or semi-supervised deep transfer learning. So that is the, the, the end of uh, my talk. So thank you very much for your high attention and you can contact me uh, via the email, Facebook or LinkedIn. So thank you again for having me and I hope you learned something from this short talk, yeah. We have a couple of questions from the audience. Maybe mm -hmm. we'll take one or two and then go to the next speaker. So the okay. first question is, in poor lighting conditions and rainy scenarios, how sound your and team solution would work? You, you mean for the, the, the good lighting? Yeah. 
Yeah. And then the dim light, or I mean, no. I can see it clearly. Dim light. Uh huh. I see. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Because I mean, mainly we we use. I believe we have to train on on board. If we can have a data set on board, it will be, I mean, more flexible in in handling in case of the, uh, the the with the enough light or the dim light. But but of course, if in term of the, I think in dim light, if we can still extract the object and then also uh, can get the motion information, it can be able to classify. Yeah, but it's better to have the the data set that contain the dim light condition as well to to get the best performance. Yeah. Uh, another question: is How does the GN network learn the anomaly when it is fed with unreadable data? Unreadable data, I guess. I mean, I mean, in in our case, I mean, we uh we we use can uh, mainly to learn the the normal event instead of the. Uh, anomaly event because uh, mainly when we uh, look at the scene uh, and then we can we can extract the the normal pattern it, it would be more effective uh, when we, and then when we compare to like the the localization of the the, the object when that is the abnormal behavior so i mean in our case we, we start from the uh, learning the generator will learn the the normal not not the abnormal yeah, but of course it can be another way around, but we have to investigate on that. Yeah. Okay, uh, so that was wonderful presentation by uh, Dr. Supavadi. Thanks a lot for joining us. And uh, we also request you to stay back for other speaker sessions. So okay. uh, again, thanks a lot. And any other questions, uh, Dr. Supavadi has already shared the email ID. You can write to her, she'll be happy to answer. So okay. having said this, I have... Uh, our next speaker, Karthik Kulkarni. So uh, we have uh, three sponsors. One of the major sponsors is IEEE HAC. And uh, we had three sessions already of IEEE HAC. One was tutorial. Another one was a paper presentation session. Again, we had paper presentation. And in the after the keynote session, we have one more paper presentation session. But uh, now also this is sponsored by IEEE HAC. Thank you IEEE HAC for sponsoring. And uh, we have with us uh, Karthik Kulkarni, who is the IEEE HAC chair. So he'll be delivering us talk on if you don't measure the social impact, does it exist? So I would like to introduce Dr. I mean Karthik Kulkarni. Um, most importantly, he hailed from Bangalore section. That's like, uh, it's good to know that uh, Karthik is from Bangalore section way back in 2011 before that. And now he's with uh, USA uh, at, uh, he's the chairman of IEEE Humanitarian Activities Committee, the st strategic global arm of IEEE board of directors that manages IEEE portfolio of programs and multi-million dollar project investment that leverage 400,000 plus engineers in 160, Sustainable Development Program, guiding all of us uh, by being chair of IEEE HAC. In 2019, Karthik has spearheaded social impact measurement of IEEE sustainable development projects around the world using the technique of social ROI. Karthik also heads Oracle team architecturing the blockchain transition transaction engine. He is a co-inventor on 10 plus US patents, both granted and few of them are pending. The Discover E Foundation recognized Karthik as a 2015 USA's uh, new face of engineering. So, Namaskara Karthik, and uh, the session is over to you. I'll make presenter so that uh, you can start with your session. Thanks a lot for sponsoring and thanks a lot for joining us. Over to you. Thank you very much, Abhishek. Uh, it's really my pleasure uh, speaking to uh, people from Bangalore. Um, I, I, as Abhishek was Abhishek mentioned, I am originally from Bangalore. Uh, well, I, I, I worked in Bangalore for a couple of years from 2009 and 2000, uh, between 2009 and 2011. And uh, during that time, I chaired the IEEE Bangalore's Young Professional Group. So Bangalore section is really very special to me. And I'm really happy to share some of my thoughts today with uh, all of you. 
So let me share my screen. Um, okay. Can people uh, see my slides? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Abhishek. Uh, so um, today's topic that I would like to share with you all is, if you don't measure social impact, does it exist? Uh, well, more importantly, um, I think whether uh, the question of does social impact exist or not, I think measurement is an important aspect. And I'm talking in the context of uh, what we call the humanitarian projects, technology projects that are that aim to solve local problems. So as Abhishek um, mentioned, I chair the IEEE Humanitarian Activities Committee in 2020 and 2019. Uh, so as part of uh, my tenure as the chair, we have really focused impact measurement. And uh, over the course of the slides, you will see why we, we prioritized impact measurement and how this whole aspect of impact measurement really helps in making sure that the pr projects uh, may not necessarily be technology for humanity projects, but any project really forces projects to be more effective. So before I begin, uh, let me give a little bit of introduction on what is HAC or the Humanitarian Activities Committee. Abhishek mentioned that HAC is the committee of the IEEE Board of Directors. Uh, it is a standing committee of the board. We support uh, effective local projects where engineers come together to solve local problems using technology solutions. We'll see some examples, but my committee is geared to support such efforts. Uh, we have a program called SITE, which stands for Special Interest Groups on Humanitarian Technology. I think a lot of you uh, might be aware of this program. And uh, we will see, you know, what are the various ways in which uh, our programs support local projects. Uh, so this year is a, is a very uh, difficult year for us, uh, of course, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. But uh, I'm very happy to share that IEEE as an organization has really stood together and, and really taken an active role in combating this pandemic. We launched a call for proposals um, a few months back uh, where we said we are going to support the projects that are focused on COVID response. And uh, we received an overwhelming 112 proposals in very short time, in a matter of a month or two. And we've supported, uh, I think, over 65 projects this year. So, you know, they're all around the world. But as you can see, India is really uh, a very active bed for a lot of these projects. So India, in fact, has received the highest number of project grants this year. We're really, uh, you know, very happy with the way humanitarian uh, technology projects are, are becoming a focus for uh, volunteers in India. So here is an example of um, one of our projects from South Sudan. This is called Community Mask Making Project. Really, our volunteers are working with the community to really locally manufacture uh, personal protection equipment. Uh, and this is for the internally displaced people. Um, you know, the problems, uh, India's problems such as migrant workers are kind of similar in other parts of the world. And uh, locally manufactured personal protection equipment uh, really helps the communities. I have another example to share with you. Uh, this is a project from Bangladesh. Uh, Bangladesh has an interesting problem. So, um, you know, I, I was there in Bangladesh in 2016, and what I could see was there were lots of manual rickshaw pullers, right? I think a lot of you, uh, you know, can empathize with the concept of rickshaw, but I think in Bangladesh, there were manual cycle rickshaws. I asked them, why don't, why don't they use motorized rickshaws? So what they said is, you know, government has banned access to, elect, you know, to, to recharge electrical, electric rickshaws. I asked why, and they said that uh, they, they had to do that because their grid does not support the huge demand from these uh, electric rickshaws. So what our group, um, site group in Bangladesh has done is uh, really built off-grid charging stations. They've also improvised the, the design of these manual rickshaws 
by kind of making these rickshaws run hybrid effort, both on um, you know manual cycling and also on uh, battery power, so that they could increase the range, uh, mileage range that can be accomplished uh, using uh, the battery power, right? So they are licensing this technology to the local manufacturers. This is a fantastic example. There are many, many examples coming from India, Southeast Asia, and other parts of the world. So, you know, we have more than, I think around 150 groups in 50 countries. Uh, they're called as site groups, special interest groups on humanitarian technology. We have over 10,000 site members in over 104 countries. And, uh, you know, we have funded over a hundred projects in the last four or five years. In 2016, I served as the uh, first chairman of the site steering committee. And uh, this was a very special opportunity for me to see this huge growth in the volunteer interest across the world. So this is, this is what HAC uh, support. This is how HAC supports the humanitarian projects. So we have uh, a, a couple of funding programs for small projects and for large projects. So we fund, uh, the, the, you know, anywhere from $500 to $60,000 per project. We support conference participation of our volunteers, and we also support events such as the Connect event that, that we are assemb assembled for. So before, before going to the impact measurement topic, uh, let, me, uh, let me state what the problem is, right? So it is, there is no doubt that there are lots of organizations, uh, lots of individuals contributing to achieve the sustainable development goals. These are the 17 goals that 190 plus countries agreed upon as the priorities for the governments uh, to meet these goals by 2030. And uh, it is estimated that there's around $2.5 trillion uh, when, it, when it comes to supporting initiatives to meet these sustainable development goals. So a deeper look, of, uh, look into why this is happening will reveal that, you know, there is, there is really this concept of funding that is prevalent, which really means that the support, financial support for these projects is happening via a moral imperative, right? Now, this concept of funding, where there is no return, no kind of expectation on a return on investment can only go so far. So no doubt there's a $1.4 trillion gap, right? So I think the new normal or new kind of trend that can actually support these projects and, and help us achieve these goals is the financing, sustainable financing concept. What this means is, in addition to achieving the impact, we achieve also some financial return so that we don't burn out the principle. And I think, I think this trend is a very important trend for all of us to, to really, really bank upon. So, you know, you might have heard about this concept of impact investing. Uh, the idea is basically, in addition to financial return, there is a measurable impact, right? And measurable is the key because uh, financial uh, investors really want to quantify stuff. And uh, Global Impact Investors Network, GIN, has estimated that the size of this market is $500 billion. So it is kind of inevitable for we social impact project doers to really tap into this huge potential, right? But then it's not so easy. There are several challenges, and I'll, I'll highlight on a couple of challenges. You know, there's this challenge of risk versus uncertainty. What this means is, uh, if you invest in any financial uh, product, there is some amount of risk, right? Uh, the, the, the outcomes are known, but the probabilities of, of kind of uh, achieving those outcomes are, are kind of uh, unknown, or, or they're not close to one, right? So that's risk. But in these projects, we have uncertainty where both probabilities and outcomes are unknown, right? So this is a big, big challenge for a serious investment to flow in, right? And then there's a lack of due diligence. If you, if you invest in any financial initiative, right? There's a lot of due diligence. 
you know, there are audit audits. If you invest in any company, as you could see in a publicly traded company, you know, there's balance sheets that are audited, they're reported in a certain format. You can compare the financial performance. There are lots of data points, assured data points that you can rely on to see how your investment is, is, is performing. But with respect to social impact, there is no auditing in place, structured auditing in place. Even if, it's, if, it's, if there is, the percentage of funding of the overall project that needs to go to measure the impact is really high. It is kind of infeasible. So there's due diligence at the functional level, technical level, quality level, and operational level. And all of this needs to happen in order to give uh, assurance for the investors to see that to a to, to to prove that there is some financial return and b to measure the social impact right so this brings to our challenge number three which is impact measurement right how can we claim that our efforts are having any sort of social impact so you know this this uh, saying from william thompson comes to my mind if you can't measure it you can't improve it so measurement is not only important to prove that impact is there, but it's also important, it's mainly important to improve it, right? You know, there's another uh, famous saying in this regard, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it, right? How do you, how do you manage when you can't measure it? This is, a, this is a very profound statement. And finally, I think this is my favorite, favorite uh, quote. If you can't measure it, it does not exist. Now, now the debate is not whether impact exists or does not exist, but it is it is most it is about measuring it, right? If you measure it, you can manage it, you can improve it. So this is a big challenge for all of us. How do we measure the impact of our projects, right? So really, what what today's state of the world is is that how much impact each project has had on the society. And how, how does this compare with other projects? This is a very hard question to answer. Okay. There's a lack, there's several reasons. There, there, there's a lack of uh, a unified framework to measure the impact. There's a lack of commonly used language when it comes to defining social impact. And there is no way to learn from previous projects, although there are many, many attempts to solve the same problem, right? So if you look at our impact reporting maturity, you know, you, you all might have submitted reports about whatever it is, about activities, about, about this conference, about uh, any social impact project. When you write a report, what I have observed is that our reporting is mostly focused on anecdotal evidence, you know, sharing stories that because of whatever we did, some one person accomplished something, right? Anecdotes are important. But, but that cannot be measurement. We rarely use some custom defined metrics that, that try to quantify the impact to some extent, but still that, that's still a minority of the projects. But if you see the entire spectrum of impact reporting, there are standardized metrics, there are mappings to sustainable development goals, and there is finally dollar quantification of the outcomes. We really have to move and propel our maturity, impact reporting maturity from anecdotal to quantified impact reporting. If you look at our impact analysis maturity, how do we analyze whether we have been successful? We focus on activities. We think that doing a conference, for example, and uh, gathering 500 members is success, right? We focus on activities. But really what is more important is what is the outcome of this for each of the attendees? I'm, I'm taking conference as an example, but this, this largely applies to the social impact projects. Focus on outcomes going beyond activities and outputs is the real maturity. And we have to, we have to really go to that stage. So in Humanitarian Activities Committee this year, we piloted a technique called social return on investment in 2019. Uh, social return on investment is really, uh, in short, a way to express the impact in dollar terms. So the, the typically social ROI is reported as for every $1 invested in an initiative, there's X dollars of social benefits created, right? So that is, that is a typical way in which it is reported. 
Now, more than what the social return on investment ratio is, the whole technique via which we come towards quantifying the impact is really, really fascinating. It is something that can that that opens our eyes uh, to not only what impact we have we are creating, but also what negative impact or unintended consequences that we may be giving birth to. Let me let me show you an example. So let's say you know we we wanted to deploy a microgrid in an off-grid Zambian community. Right? This is this is a typical project that you all might have seen. Deploying a microgrid in a in a community. So this is a very common theme for our projects. Now let's say you invested a hundred thousand dollars in this project, right? And you deployed a hundred uh, a microgrid that powers one hundred homes. Now that's the output. Now what is the outcome? There could be multiple outcomes, but let me let me use one particular outcome here in this example, which is because of whatever you have done, you increase the business hours of some home-based businesses in that community because of access to electricity, access to lighting and so forth, right? So let's say that's your outcome. Then you'd have to go deeper into what, ha how do you quantify this outcome? So let's say, let's assume that you resulted in 20% increase in the income of the, of the small home-based businesses. Then we, we can give a value to it. So, so if the average household income in this community was $700, then you, because of your project, because of you increasing the business hours of some home-based businesses, you accounted for, let's say, 20% increase in the income. So that's the $143, right? Now, if you multiply this by the percentage of the home-based businesses, in this case, I'm assuming it's 25, and you annualize the returns, you could say that you know there was forty-two thousand nine hundred dollars of returns created. If you assume that your project, which is a microgrid, is you know it can it can sustain for at least three years, then you can multiply this by three and say that you have created because of this project uh, a social returns of one hundred twenty-eight thousand dollars and seven hundred. So. You know, this ratio of 1.28, which is SROI divided by the investment becomes apparent. Now, this is one very simplistic example of how you can quantify the impact that you have created because of a microgrid project. You know, we have published uh, more details on how, how we did this for more than 10 projects. And I also have a call to action at the end of the slides. I want to highlight that there are multiple global standards where people have tried to define the outcome definitions. Uh, as an example, you know, there's a standard called as impact reporting and investment standards. Uh, you know, this is really for impact investing purposes. And one of the metric says that the client households, which are provided with no access is one of the metric. And uh, if we align this microgrids projects outcome to this particular standard definition, then we can open up uh, this project for consideration by the impact investors, right? So uh, a very, a very kind of simplistic view of how do you measure the social return on investment? So this is, this is a typical workflow, okay? So you start with listing the stakeholders who are involved and impacted in this project. It, you know, it's important to involve all the stakeholders, including the beneficiaries, intermediaries, your projects team, et cetera, right? Then comes the question of what has changed for them, right? Something has to change, you know, in order, in order for you to claim that there is some impact. Then comes the question of, can you define that change in terms of an output or an outcome, right? Then you'd have to, really consider negative factors in addition to positive. You cannot assume that whatever has changed and has resulted in some output and outcome is necessarily positive, right? There's, there, there's a, there was a economist that we were talking to. He asked us an interesting question. You know, how can you prove that the new microgrid that you have deployed does not support a new brothel in that community? Now, this is, this is we did not think about that. 
So it's important to consider the negative aspects, negative outputs and outcomes. Once you do that, then comes an interesting phase of giving that outcome a dollar value. Now, there is a lot of research when it comes to assigning dollar values to outcomes. For example, you know, there are multiple papers published on estimating the carbon emissions cost uh, if, the, if, if the outcome is environmental and so forth. I've, I've not gone too, too deep into assigning a dollar value, but this workflow from step one, mapping the stakeholders to considering outputs and outcomes and deciding which one is negative is a very important workflow. Let me, let me throw a little bit of light on what is the negative impact. There are four types of negative impacts, which I think we should, we should really consider. First type of negative impact is attribution. What this means is, you know, you can't assume that all the impact that is created by your project is because of your project, <laughs> okay? So there could be other reasons because of which the community might be experiencing positive or negative impact. So you will have to give consideration to that. You'll have to attribute a portion of your impact to other, other sources that cause impact. Displacement, what this means is because of your project, what would happen and it did not happen, right? Uh, I'll give you an example. Because of the, the, there, was a, there was a famous project where, uh, you know, an initiative distributed mosquito nets in, in one of the African communities. What that resulted in is, of course, you know, you know the, the intention was good to save patients from malaria, which is really important initiative. But as a byproduct, unintentionally, it put local mosquito net manufacturers out of business, right? So it really had a displacement. So we have to consider the negative impact of this project as well. Then comes the concept of dead weight. Now, what this means is, you know, your project is not the only thing in the world. Even without your project, things would have happened anyways, right? So what would actually happen anyways even if your project was not there. So that is, that is what is referred to as dead weight. You have to factor in that. Finally, you know, we come to the concept of drop off. What that means is, you know, you did a project and you deployed some microgrid. You can't assume that it will continue to operate forever. You know, after a few years of lifetime, it will die down, right? So you have to stop giving credit to your project after a certain point of drop off. So we have to factor in all of these to really look at what is both positive and negative impact of a project. So anyways, as I mentioned, we did this pilot uh, on 10 different projects around the world. And uh, we, we, we had amazing learnings. One of our biggest learning was this stuff can be too complicated for the engineers because this is social science, right? So, you know, what we, we did is we, we call our fellow IEEE programs as Impact League. You know, we, these participants, the Impact League, including IEEE Foundation, IEEE Smart Village, IEEE Site, Epics, all of us came together and, and really said that, let's launch a program which is devoted to measuring impact, right? In addition to creating impact, which as, as we saw, a lot of people are creating impact. Let's come together to measure the impact, right? So we are launching a new program called as Peer Review for Impact Assessment. What this means is just like the way you come together, write a proposal to do a project, you can come together and write a proposal to evaluate the impact of a project. That project could be within your own section, within your own um, community, your own geography, but, but most importantly, you have to be, you should not be from the project team. You should be a peer team of the project team, and you could come together and apply with an impact assessment plan, and you could evaluate the impact. By doing this, you're not only helping the community, you're not only helping the project team, but you are also surfacing the lessons to be learned to the broader global IEEE community. You will be doing a big service uh, of the magnitude similar to, to that of the project doers, right? You are no less important than the project doer. 
we highly encourage you to come come forward apply to this peer review program and then really assess the impact of IEEE's social impact projects. We have launched an educational program on this. We have launched a new course, a short course on how to measure impact. Uh, during the HAC's education forum, we unveiled this course. You know, you can learn more about this program on, on the IEEE HAC's uh, educational forum. And here are some of the links where you can look at the case studies, where you can uh, look at the courses. And you know, I highly, highly encourage you to, to, in this marathon, to master the social impact measurement art. This will really be useful, not only in the IEEE context, but I'm sure in your professional context as well. Thank you very much, and uh, I'm open for questions. Abhishek, over to you. Yeah. Thank you, Karthik, for the wonderful session. It was totally different. I expected that you'll talk about HAC uh, events, uh, I mean, HAC projects and events, but we also got to know a lot of things about sustainable goals, how we can get connected. I just wanted to elevate a few things about uh, IEEE Bangalore section site and HAC. I'm chairing the local Bangalore uh, section site and HAC here. So we have almost, we started with uh, uh, two years back, we were just and now we are almost a thousand people in Bangalore section who are part of site, but still we are making sure that we want more members uh, to join and we are promoting it. So again, I want to promote all of you. Please join IEEE HAC because uh, uh, IEEE site, it's free membership, even non IEEE members can join. And uh, we wanted to have Sampath also as part of this, but you know, he's a uh, little bit, uh, uh, he's going to some procedure now. So he told we do an exclusive hands-on session for all our participants again sometime in July end. So we are planning for that, and uh, we also received one of the COVID-19 funding uh, uh, as part of HAC projects of around five thousand dollars, and recently it got published in IEEE Spectrum also. And uh, we are doing amazing activities, Karthik. Uh, thanks for the support. I also have uh, our other panelists who are. Uh, Part, I'm who have volunteered with me for IEEE site or HAC. Thanks for that. So we have a couple of questions, Karthik, for you. How much IEEE is leveraging the metrics process of United Nations yearly reporting on each country and how we are making progress on SDG 2030? Yeah, thanks, Jayan. So uh, actually, it's an interesting question from Jayan because he's on our uh, uh, project committee. So, as you know, Jayan, uh, we are barely mapping the impact to the sustainable development goals. Uh, we now have question or, or rather fields in every single project and proposal where we kind of map a project to, to one or more sustainable development goals. Now, that said, that's the extent of our, our usage of metrics at this point. So that is why this whole push on impact measurement, whole push on using standardized metrics is being brought into HAC. And I hope, I mean, for these 10 projects in the pilot, we did use metrics, but I hope that every single project in IEEE will use uh, some metrics and hopefully align them with the sustainable development goals, align them with the global metrics that are standardized by different organizations in the future. Uh, one more question before we close your session is could uh, this is from Deepankar Das, who is one of our uh, attendee. Could IEEE HAC engage with NGOs to measure their project? Yeah, so th that's a very good question. So in the first phase, what we're saying is these peer reviews for impact measurement, we would like them to be devoted to measure the impact of our own projects. Now, there is a certain level of capacity building that we need to do within our volunteers uh, so that they they gain some level of expertise and then you know my personal personally speaking i would be very happy if our volunteers provided this very important service of measuring impact to the ngos because that brings credibility you know just an organization of the stature of IEEE coming in and measuring the impact of ngos and both helping the ngos to run efficiently and to tell the story better to the funders of the NGO, you know, it's amazing. So I, I would I would love to see our volunteers do that. Okay, thank you. 
last question uh, before we close is i mean it's uh, it's something i thought important to address is how about chapter specific site activities maybe they can start a site group can you elaborate on that please sure so uh, yes i think i think society chapters i, I believe you are referring to society chapters sites can be formed at ch chapters uh, it can be formed in student branches and sections and uh, and and you can you know, six all, all we need is a problem statement and an area of focus and six plus IEEE members to come together to form a site. And once they do that, there are the benefits that, that you know, I mentioned in the slide, you know, they could apply for project funding, they could apply for event funding, they could apply for conference participation, and they could uh, you know, partner with the local organizations to solve local problems. Uh, we, as Abhishek mentioned, I think Sampat uh, will be doing a more hands-on session on this and we'll be very happy to support uh, as many site groups in, in, in the chapters. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Karthik. Yeah, Sampat, uh, I mean, unfortunately, we couldn't have him here in this uh, conference, but soon we are going to organize a bigger session. We are also planning a ITPLE site day or site, you know, summit for Region 10. So soon we'll keep all of you posted on that. So uh, thanks a lot, Karthik, for that amazing session. And uh, I know we have globally participants whom we can say good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and also somebody good midnight, I would say. We have uh, all over uh, world people have joined and there is also live streaming on uh, Facebook, which is happening. We'll also be keeping all these recordings for some time so that all our attendees who missed uh, these uh, important sessions can look that later. So thanks a lot, Karthik, for uh, uh, spending time with us. And uh, we also request you to please stay back for some time because we have other our HAC volunteers, our site volunteers will be speaking in uh, a couple of minutes. So Chandrakant, sir, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Avishik, and thank you, Kulkarni, for the uh, nice session. Uh, we'll move to our uh, next speaker, and uh, Dr. Sheila uh, Shahnaj. I'll introduce the speaker. Uh, Sheila Shahnaj, sen uh, senior member of IEEE and fellow IEB, received a PhD degree from Concordia University, Canada, and she is a professor in the department of IEEE uh, in BUET, Bangladesh, since uh, 2015. She has published uh, more than 115 international journal and conference papers. She is a recipient of Canadian and Kamalan Scholarship or Fellowship at Bangladesh Academy of Science Gold Medal for her contribution in the science and technology. Her papers have received Best Paper Awards in uh, Tencon at Wicon and in Humanitarian Challenge Tracks at uh, Art in HTC. She was the mentor of first and second prize winning project in IEEE IAS EMD contest, robotics and humanitarian aspects in, uh, in USA. And she was the supervisor of fourth and fifth rank winning uh, team in Scopus uh, competition, ICAWSP. She has around 20 years of experience in leading impactful technical and professional educational, uh, educational industrial women environment and humanitarian technology projects at the national and international level. She is a candidate for 2021-22 uh, IEEE Region 10 Director Elect, uh, Delegate Elect, Chair and IEEE Bangalore Section, uh, 2022 mem uh, 2020 member, member IEEE New Initiative Committee, 2022 Chair in Women uh, Inside Working Group. Uh, IEEE, he is a member of IEEE Signal Processing Society, Women in Signal Processing Committee. Uh, she uh, is a senior member elevation uh, drives, IEEE WIE. In 29-20 uh, uh, member, uh, IEEE WIE, we power subcommittee, and uh, many other region committee of that one. And uh, I don't want to take much of his uh, hard time because uh, time is limited. And all this biodata is with, uh, it's posted in our website. I request uh, uh, the viewer to go through her uh, long list of uh, achievements. So with this small introduction, I uh, leave this uh, podium for
for her to start uh, her presentation. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for, uh, for this humble introduction. Uh, thank you, Connect, for inviting me. Let me share the slides. One second. Yeah, can you see the full slide? Yeah, now it's fine. You are okay. audible also. Kindly go ahead. Okay, thank you very much uh, for this morning session and thank you the audience and IEEE Connect. Uh, I will be uh, focusing on signal processing and machine learning for speech and biomedical applications. That is one of my research areas. Uh, Wait a second, because it's taking time to go to the next slide because of internet connectivity. Actually, uh, what I want to uh, request everyone uh, from uh, my uh, from my perspective that. Uh, there are more than 39 technical society uh, in IEEE. I request graduate student or everyone to be part of at least one of the technical societies because I myself is the founder of four technical society chapters in Bangladesh, uh, signal processing, robotics and automation, industrial application, um, uh, society on social implications on technology. So um, there are many other uh, technical society chapters with whom I'm working, Power and Energy Society, Engineering and Medicine and Biology Society. So today my uh, work uh, will present the interdisciplinary aspect of my research life. Uh, I'm facing some problem because I want to change the slide, but it is not changing. Uh, have, you shared, have you shared the content or uh, shared the screen? You can share the content, what you can try. Yes, I have shared the content because you can see this, see this right? Yeah, I'm seeing your opening slide only. Yes, but uh, the second slide is not moving. Uh, can you escape and go to okay. normal? Yeah. No. Yeah. Now you got it, right? Second yeah. slide? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Actually, uh, uh, as you said, the, I request everyone to go to my website, www.celiashanas.com to get uh, an overview of the type of work I do and the role I play in section, in student branch, in student branch chapters, in region, and in global committees. Uh, so I, uh, what I wanted to say that uh, my work is interdisciplinary. I must first show my gratitude to the Atipuli Bangalore section. Uh, we have a long standing relationship. The first woman in India Global Summit, that was in 2016. This is the first one day summit in whole region 10. I was the program uh, chair and the summit co-chair uh, as a region 10 WA chair. Uh, for the 50 year celebration of Region 10. And also, uh, I was the program chair of IEEE Region 10 SYWM Congress. And the most recently, we really did a collaborative conference between IEEE Bangladesh section and IEEE Bangalore section, IEEE Week on EC 2019. So I'm grateful uh, to all the Bangalore section members and volunteers for creating a long lasting relationship. And these activities and technical activities means a lot. And it means that when, uh, uh, when a, an activity is launched, it, if it is good, it can go beyond borders. We can easy 
I was the founder in Bangladesh, first woman in engineering conference in the area of electrical and computer engineering. And then it moved in different countries, different states of India. And finally, last year it was in Bangalore. I uh, really, uh, we look forward to work more together. So I really believe in power of networking and innovative ideas and that we did in power and energy society uh, pays the celebration our women in engineering uh, affinity group had done in the celebration. This is a human chain from people, volunteers from industry, who are entrepreneurs, who are sponsors, who are young professional, who are women in engineering members. So these innovative ideas I always apply in my research. I request all of you to visit my Google Scholar citations. And uh, that's the thing. If you look at the pattern of the Google Scholar citation that is shown from 2013 to 2020, we are in the middle of 2020, you can see it is always rising. And that what Kartik was telling, impact uh, that you, we, we must do that direction of research, that topic of research that is useful for others and that can create impact on others. So the, if you can see my paper, uh, denoising of ECT signals based on noise reduction algorithms in empirical mode decomposition and wavelet domains has citation of 270. Uh, it indicates that it's, it doesn't matter where you are, uh, it doesn't matter how much high your limitations are, but if you have a good idea, if you have a good drive, you will always find a venue for collaboration and you can always inspire your students or younger generation to publish better work that can be cited by others and that can be useful for others. So whenever, personally, whenever I, uh, start any research along with my research group, I always uh, think about connecting it to one of the sustainable development goals uh, provided by UN. You know this. And uh, one of the work I want to state that is published in IT transaction in audio speech and language processing, and that is speech estimation or fundamental estimation, fundamental frequency estimation. Uh, and that is uh, with my supervisor, who is a fellow of IEEE in Canadian University. And you see, it has been cited by, since 2012, it has been cited by 37 researchers. And problem is uh, that if we want to find this fundamental frequency from a studio quality environment, it's not a big deal. But problem is when we are in a factory floor for an industrial application, when you are in a a car in car communication or you are in an exhibit hall or you are in a canton or you are uh, in a train or bus finding the fundamental frequency for further application is a mammoth task i really request you to visit it and from the figure you can see that compared to the um, uh, compared to the clean one that is given by the first figure uh, uh, the below figure shows that uh, uh, we can do a better uh, tracking of the fundamental frequency compared to the other methods. And this speech counter shows the effectiveness of our method and it can be applied to many applications like uh, fundamental frequency of power signals, harmonics, uh, if you want to find uh, the um, uh, the uh, harmonics of power signals and other things, so several other application it has. And this is also, there are a lot of people uh, who are using hearing impaired, uh, hearing aid devices. But you know, if you think about India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka, uh, these hearing aid devices are very expensive. Um, but so we really need to use some speech enhancement method, which is accurate at the same time, and that is low cost at the same time, that will be easy to implement because the computational uh, complexity should be lower. And this is a work of three generation, my master's student who uh, and my myself and my PhD supervisor, you can see uh, the blue curves in the top uh, shows the actual pattern of the uh, 
uh, speech uh, what uh, can be obtained in the um, clean uh, condition. But if you see the uh, see the last one that is our proposed method, we are able to track the first one compared to the other a tree given in the middle. And it has been cited by 26 peoples since it is published in 2014 in IEEE Transaction and Audio Speech and Language Processing. Actually, that gives us hope uh, that even if it is a statistical method, uh, this type of noise enhancer, uh, noise suppressor, well, we can use in case of hearing a device, which will be low cost and we can deploy in the local community. Uh, this is that uh, ECG, electrocardiogram. You know it very well. Uh, when you are handling ECG signal, we are capturing it through the LEDs. But uh, when you are capturing it through the LEDs, there are a lot of noises. Uh, but uh, we have to find the effective uh, noise reduction algorithm uh, that will help you uh, to uh, do to identify uh, the ECG arrhythmia. That is very important. Arrhythmia is very important for uh, detecting the fatal disease and to help the doctors to provide quick treatment. And that has been, this is the, that has cited paper. Uh, that's a very important thing uh, that uh, we are doing for many years. And uh, now we are helping, we are trying to develop an app that will help the doctors to do this denoising uh, very quickly and help the doctors to have this denoised ECG data for a better uh, treatment. And I, I should show you something because, you know, if I study the number of uh, uh, diabetic patients in our communities are very, very high. So for regular uh, surveillance of blood glucose or monitoring of blood glucose is a common thing. Think about a uh, woman who are living in the hill tracks community. He or she uh, may not have a glucometer because it, because it is expensive. And not only that, if he or she comes to the town for blood glucose estimation, which needs regular monitoring, uh, the process is invasive. But you know, it's, you know, the invasive process is uh, very problematic because we do not have enough expert nurse compared to the number of patients in our countries. That's why we have proposed a non-invasive technique for blood glucose, and that is portable, wearable. Processing will be done in a Raspberry Pi, and we will uh, sense it to the PPG, and there will be Arduino and other sensor, and it will look like a wearable. Uh, because it is like a watch and it is portable. These are the different things we have to consider uh, that when we want to uh, we want to employ, deploy our research to the local community, and uh, that must be uh, that must be affordable, that must be portable, that must be wearable. Of course, it must be sustainable and also it is scalable. It can be applicable everywhere. And. Uh, as I as I uh, as I faced in my life when my son was born, uh, she uh, he has a new natal jaundice. But I have seen how painful it was to take the blood and uh, from a new natal baby and also find the bilirubin level, wait and wait for the um, report to come. That's why I. Uh, requested my students uh, that although they are not mechanical engineers, they have devised such a structure that can be deployed in any community clinic where um, uh, we don't need to have a smartphone to take the uh, sclera image to measure the yellowness of the eye. And this smartphone does not need to be owned by every member of uh, your community. At least one smartphone in a community clinic will serve you better. And from the yellowness of the data, applying machine learning and signal processing, uh, we really can have a blue ribbon level and we can uh, quantify the jaundice, uh, the, what is the level of the jaundice. And, and that is a completely non-invasive method. And, you know, we are the only nation that fought for uh, our language in 1952. And there are a lot of people who are deaf 
and we told them different, we usually call them different term, which is very problematic for me. We must tell them differently able people because we want to make them differently able by using the technology. But, uh, but if we uh, develop the sign language recognition system in English, then there will be no use. That's why our people, our students, uh, uh, we worked with uh, Bangladesh Deaf Association, and we have created this database of sign language in Bengali language, and we have applied neural network, deep neural network technique to find uh, this alphabet recognition show so that we can ensure the, the education, entertainment, and accessibility of such community. We can start with, and we can think about uh, creating an interface so that they can go to library and order a book. They can go to a restaurant and order a food. That is very, very important. And uh, since there are 51 universities in Bangladesh, uh, it was very low before 2015. And during my tenure, it got almost uh, very high uh, from 28, it reached to 51. And I visited many outside universities, local communities, where I found our women or children are suffering from the skin diseases, but they are not at all aware. And they don't feel the necessity of treating it, but it is very severe problem. But as a signal processing machine learning researcher, what we can do, we can take the digital image of such um, uh, disease and uh, apply machine learning and pattern recognition technique to find what type of um, cancer it is. It will actually help the doctor to take the decision faster and decision will be accurate. And it is very important uh, rather than doing only subjective evaluation, this type of objective evaluation will give and help the doctor to diagnose it very quickly. And let us uh, make an elaboration on a particular topic that we have recently worked with my undergraduate as a student, that because many people are doing now deep learning, machine learning, AI, but you know, we have developed a new network, capsule network. This network is for abnormality detection in musculoskeletal radiographs. Usually for such radiographs, uh, what doctors just observe and provide the decision. But we wanted to uh, develop an efficient um, capsule network that will give you more accurate result and decision will be faster if you have a fast computing machine. And uh, this is uh, this overall structure. There will be input, of course, there will be pre-processing. Madam, I just want to tell you that uh, five minutes are left. Okay. Uh, there, uh, there are a lot of convolutional neural network and there is primary capsule and there are optimization. And finally, class capsule will give you the output. And this is the uh, data set uh, resizing. We have increased the resized data so that we can have a better feature. And you can see from the picture, see that if you go for two to four cross two to four, you can have a better feature compared to the first one. That's the pre-processing. And for pre-processing, uh, compared to this visual observation, we have used a brisk and nick score that will give you an objective data. And also in terms of accuracy, training accuracy and validation accuracy, there is a rational that we found that we can have a better, uh, we, can, uh, we can go for a higher resized image in terms of better, in terms of lower brisk score and NIC score and in terms of better training and validation accuracy. And this is the proposed capsule structure. You can see that there is a one convolutional network and there is another convolutional network. Then we will apply routing by agreement algorithm to get the capsule. The capsule, there are two capsules, whether it is normal or abnormal. Please, uh, uh, this is the data set. That is the Mura data set, uh, 14,600. Uh, 56 images are available, Nine, 8,941 images are normal, and 5,715 images are abnormal. That means, and uh, this routing algorithm is very important because it gives you uh, the guarantee that input from lower level capsule will send to the higher level capsule that agrees with the input. But we can see 
uh, for different types of images like finger, elbow, hand, humerus, forehead, shoulder, and wrist, uh, we can see that uh, if we, uh, the training and validation accuracy is better if we increase the routing by algorithm, routing algorithm, but for some cases we face overfitting, that's why we have proposed the number of routing algorithm is four. And now we want to know what is the effectiveness of the proposed capsule network in terms of Kappa statistics code compared to the dense net, uh, our uh, caps net uh, using the same MURA data set gives a better um, score, Kappa score 80.115% compared to 7.5%. And this is also, we have shown it in terms of graph and the, what is the claim? The proposed capset architecture provides almost 10% better Kappa score <clears throat> than the 169 layers of dense net while using 50% less training data. And this is the result. Uh, we can see that compared to the, uh, compared, this is the comparison paper with which we compared and we can see the training and testing sick accuracy. And then if you go to the next slide, the accuracy of CAPSNET using the four routing in MURA data set, training and testing accuracy both are very high compared to the uh, compared to the uh, compared to the comparison paper that we have used for our method. And this is very important loss and accuracy curve. I have the, uh, the the black and the purple one are the loss curve, blue and red one are the are the accuracy curve. You can see uh, the accuracy red. Uh, is very high for proposed uh, capsnet and the loss uh, black for the proposed capsnet is very low compared to the dense net. Uh, actually, it is a very important claim that we are uh, reducing the loss of the model compared to the uh, increased accuracy of the model. And this is the work outcome that has been published in IEEE Access with impact factor more than four along with my uh, undergrad thesis student, I will really request you to visit my um, Google Scholar citation and read it and let me know how we can do more collaboration, how we can help. And this is our 10 sim, uh, what we have uh, uh, first online virtual flagship conference in Region 10. And we also have a virtual conference organizers panels. We want to share these resources to many future conference organizers. This is some of my Awards 2013 WA Professional Volunteer Award from Region 10, 2015 WA Inspiring Member Award from Global WA, 2016 MGA Leadership Award, and 2019 Region 10 Humanitarian Activities Outstanding Volunteer Award. So there are many other group award which I led, and these groups are formed by me, Women Enduring Section and Women Enduring Student Branch. I really, uh, this is the 25 years banner that I have received as the first female chair uh, in 25 years of Bangladesh section. Uh, thank you. We have received 2018 IEEE MG Outstanding Large Section Award under my leadership. Majority of the works are very impactful technical activities, and it is a great honor to receive awards for the best uh, WA student branch, best student, best young professional group and also uh, many other things. And uh, this, uh, I, I, this is the thing that we have to really not work for ourselves. We have to work for our group. And since Cytopoly is the largest technical and professional organization in the world, we should focus on the technical activities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shilia, madam, for your uh, insightful presentation. You have shown that how the uh, local problem can be addressed using and the technology and uh, i am seeing we are running over time so i'll request the participants uh, please uh, go through uh, her uh, website and uh, you uh, post the question directly to her through email uh, kindly excuse us for uh, this time i uh, once again thank you for very much in insightful presentations and uh, that uh, talks really about the social problem and with this, we'll go to the uh, next presentation, uh, next uh, talk. Uh, so this is the last talk, but uh, uh, going to be most interesting, I suppose, because this deals with uh, uh, the most recent uh, problem that we are facing even today.
that forced us to go in virtual mode. So some part of that, I hope it will be addressed here. So let me introduce the, our next speaker, Professor uh, Noor. Uh, Noor, uh, Noor, Noor Iljab Muhammad Noor is currently attached as a professor as in UTM Rajak Faculty of uh, Faculty of Technology and Informatics, University of Technology, Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur campus. She received her BS in Electrical Engineering from Texas Tech Technical University, Lubbock, Texas, and her uh, Master's in Electrical Engineering by Research and PhD Electrical Engineering from UTM. Her research area in image processing and image analysis. Her current work uh, concentrated on medical image analysis for lung disease for medical and industry applications. Her current work concentrates on medical image analysis using machine and deep learning technique for lung disease. Classification detection, uh, classification detection using IV US image and handwriting recognition handwriting recognition. She has published many papers in journal and indexed conference proceedings and has published one academic book and two book chapters. Currently, she is the head of the electrophysiology uh, research group and Malaysia Quality Assurance Auditor for Electrical Engineering, BSc and MSc program. She is a senior member of IEEE and she has been a member for more than 32 years. In 1998 and 1990, uh, 2001, she had several held several key positions in actively Malaysia section. She is the founding chapter chair for actively Signal Processing Society Malaysia chapter in 2002, and she had the, held the position till 2006. She was elected as the actively Malaysian section chair for two years, that is 2013-14. She is an active actively uh, volunteer and held key position in IEEE Signal Processing Society Malaysia chapter and IEEE Engineering Medicine and Biology, uh, uh, Biology Science in Malaysia chapter till now. She uh, is an active member of IEEE EMBS SP Society, uh, IEEE Women in Engineering Affinity Group and IEEE My Side for Rural Technology Group in Malaysia chapter. In international level, she is currently one of the art and director elite candidate for 2021-22. Other uh, IEEE, other IEEE MGA committee positions she hold this now as IEEE EAB certificate program committee 1990 to 2019 sorry 2019 to 2020. As IEEE senior member panel reviewer 2019 to 2020. Actively SSC event evaluation panel 2020 and ICT side group uh, petition evaluation panel 2020. Previously, she was a committee member in ITP MBPSC uh, 2017 to 2018, ITP MGA GUOS S Technical Society representative 2015 2016, and ITP Art and Individual Benefits and Service Coordinators uh, 2015 2016. With this, I leave it to her for uh, her talk. Hello, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Okay, let me share you my slide. Okay, everyone can see my slides. All right, thank you very much for the uh, very warm introduction of me. Uh, thank you, uh, IEEE Connect 2020, for inviting me uh, as a keynote speaker for this uh, conference, a virtual conference. Right, so my talk today is on the diagnosis and management of lung disease. Uh, I've been working this for quite some time already, since 2002, actually. Uh, and uh, finally, I get a lot of uh, attention this year due to the COVID-19, right? Uh, okay. Uh, next, before uh, before this, uh, uh, before starting, I would like to introduce uh, University of Technology in Malaysia. All right, so we are uh, uh, one of the top five universities in Malaysia. And uh, now currently in the world ranking, uh, we are in the 1987 spot yeah, for 2021. So we've been uh, climbing up the stairs, the ladder, uh, since 2016, wow. eh, coming up from 303. Now we are in the top 200. 
for the uh, world university ranking. Okay, uh, next uh, for uh, universities under 50, meaning 50 uh, young universities, uh, 50 years of age. So we are also climbing up eh, from number 25 in 2017 to number 2021 in 2013. Uh, so I'm located in the Rasak Faculty of Technology and Informatics, which is uh, in the uh, UTM Kuala Lumpur campus. So we have two campus. The main campus is in uh, Johor Bahru, uh, which is a stone throw from Singapore. And uh, the second campus is in Kuala Lumpur, in the heart of uh, Malaysia. So this is roughly about my synopsis of my talk today. Right. So first of all, eh, because now with the COVID-19 eh, virus, so uh, uh, even uh, my talk and my work is bec uh, becoming more important now. And uh, I got a, a lot of attention and also I have two grants already for this COVID-19. Right. So we just started uh, this year and uh, so uh, we are working on it. Right, but uh, it's quite difficult to due to the MCO uh, restricted movement, and now even um, students not not yet uh, uh, not able to be in campus yet. Eh? Uh, they 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 can, but uh, they just went back eh? because previously the the student work in the campus cannot go back home, so they just went back to their hometown, and so they are taking time to come back to campus. All right, so uh, roughly uh, just a brief uh, respiratory anatomy. Eh? This is just showing about the normal lungs. So what we have here, so we breathe in the, the, the air through the nose, right? So whatever we breathe in, I uh, will come directly to the airways here, to what you call it, the trachea, and uh, right primary bronchus and the left primary bronchus, right? So we have two branches. So we have uh, the right lung and the left lung. Okay, so what's inside the lung? So inside the lung, this is uh you have the primary bronchitis. This is the, the the from the trachea just now, and uh, you have all these branches: auditory bronchus and bronchial, and terminal bronchial. Right. So terminal means the ending, and the ending what we have the alveoli. So this is the alveoli here. It's like a sac, a small bubble sac which has a membrane. Eh? So uh, this membrane is very, very important because this membrane is the task is uh, to, to change uh, the uh, oxygen gas into oxygen liquid so that it will go into the bloodstream. All right. So this all are surrounded by the uh, small, small veins. And then taking from the uh, carbon, uh, carbon dioxide liquid from the blood, bloodstream, take out and then change back to gas so it will be exhaled through the nose and the mouth again all right so this is a repetitive right so this is a very very uh what you call it, uh, complex uh, uh look simple but actually uh, what happened here is a bit complex so we need all these sex eh, to 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 so that we can get the oxygens eh, and also take out the carbon dioxide from our blood and the oxygen uh which is being transferred to the bloodstream which is uh, 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 one of the main requirements eh, uh, to sustain the cells in our body, right? So these are the description of lung disease. So we have three types, so which is the airways. And then we have uh, uh, this disease affect the tubes eh, that carry oxygen and other gases in and out of the lungs. So they usually cause a narrowing or blockage of the airways. Eh? So airways disease, including asthma, COPD, COPD due to uh, smoking, and the bronchitis. Eh? People with airway disease often say they feel as if they are trying to breathe out through a straw, meaning it's a very tight uh, passage. Uh, passage eh? uh, next is the lung tissue disease. So this disease affects the structure of the lung tissue. So scarring or inflammation of the tissue makes the lung unable to expand fully. All right. Uh, so this makes it hard for the lungs eh, to take in oxygen and release carbon dioxide. Eh? So people with this type of lung disease often say they feel as if they are wearing a too tight sweater or vest, eh? meaning that their tight, uh, their chest are tight. Eh? So uh, the the tissues eh, they cannot expand, uh, so that uh, you know you can when you need to inhale you expand, then you exhale you uh, uh, shrink a little bit the lung. All right. So next is the lung circulation disease. Uh, so these diseases affect the blood vessels in the lungs. 
So they are caused by clotting, scarring, and inflammation of the blood vessels. Eh? So they affect the ability of the lungs to take in oxygen and release carbon dioxide. Eh? So people of this condition often feel very short of breath when they exert themselves, meaning that like uh, you're walking or uh, climbing the stairs, and uh, then you, you know, short of breath, uh, meaning that you have this type of condition. All right, so meaning actually this, the, 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 uh, the gasping of airs, meaning that your body wants the oxygen, all right, so, so that it can maintain the cells, eh, that, that the, all the muscles eh, that, can, that uh, when you exert yourself, so meaning that uh, your, your, your body lack of this oxygen, so that's why you are uh, puffing away, you see. All right, so, uh, so my work, eh, I, I studied the pulmonary tuberculosis, uh, pneumonia and also lung cancer and this is uh, since uh, the previous work but only this year I started on the COVID-19 eh, due to the pandemic. All right so what is tuberculosis? Uh, so this is uh, 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 roughly uh, uh, is caused by a specific TB bacteria called Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Why we call it pulmonary? Pulmonary is a technical term for lung. Eh? So because tuberculosis also exists other types eh, like lymph node, bone, and so on. So only the, the lung tuberculosis, we call it PTB or pulmonary tuberculosis. All right, so in this study, uh, only tuberculosis that attack the lung by the respiratory. So this uh, normally, uh, 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 the infection is normally concentrated in one area, either upper, middle, or lower part of the lung. The spread is normally from inwards near the windpipe or trachea towards the outer part of the lung. Right? Uh, so this is uh, airborne disease, meaning that if somebody is infected, coughing uh, in front of you, uh, you will uh, inhale the, the, the droplets or the, the bacteria, then you will eventually get it. Right, uh, so but it takes time uh, for, for, for the infection uh, to, to, to be uh, what they call to be seen or to the symptoms to, 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 to be noticed eh, by the doctors or by yourself. Eh? So, normally, uh, uh, there will be a lot of loss of appetite and then you are very skinny. All right, next is uh, lung cancer. So, lung cancer, we have two types. Eh? So, lung cancer, uh, as you know, is the abnormal of the, of the cells. Eh? So, when the cells uh, wake up one day, try to say, okay, now I want to do something else. So meaning that the abnormality of the activity of, or the function of the cell. So then we call it a cancerous. Eh? So we have two types, which is uh, the non-small cell uh, uh, lung cancer, which is carcinoma. Uh, so this one, then they have, uh, this the non-small cell carcinoma. Then there is the small cell carcinoma. Right, so both are all, uh, you know, attacking near the tra trachea or the bronchi, right? So, and, and it will be like, you know, one cell, so it's like a, a lump of cells. So, uh, normally it can be noticeable the, uh, in the x-ray. All right, so next we have the loba pneumonia. So, loba pneumonia is defined when one section or lobe of the lung is affected. Eh? Whilst in bronchial pneumonia, patches throughout both lungs are affected. So uh yeah our lungs consist about uh, there are total in total about five loops right three on the if i'm not mistaken on the right lung and two on the left lung or i may be wrong eh? but uh this is they call it loops so uh, each loops are separated yeah so normally it won't affect one you have affected one loop seldom it will affect another loop unless yeah unless uh, like uh, there are patches throughout the lung, both lungs, so they they want to call it bronchial pneumonia. So normally the uh, uh, it will will the the alveoli. This is normal alveoli, all right. But pneumonia, they will be behave like this. So you have a thicken uh, uh, in the membrane a little bit, and you can have close or liquid maybe fill up and eh? infect that lung. All right. So the symptoms and treatments. So pneumonia, we have the coughing fever. And pneumonia normally uh, is treatable, so antibiotic and rest should be recovered in two weeks time. So when it is not recovered, then it will be something else. So normally uh, uh, the doctor will give a different antibiotic and so on and, and try to make you uh, uh, well again. Uh, next, uh, pulmonary tuberculosis. So we have coughing also, fever, loss of weight and loss of appetite. 
So normally when you cough for a long time, uh, like more than one month, and then coming with a uh, fever on and off, and also when you are loss of weight due to loss of appetite, yeah? right? So that will be, uh, you you need to go and check eh, your sputum test and also your your manchu test, eh? so, and also chest test. Too. So this uh, now the treatment will be uh you 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 will give an anti TB drug for six months, all right. The consultation is every two months to see the difference in X ray uh so that to see whether uh any improvement uh of your TB because sometimes uh there is uh, some patients have the anti drug uh uh the the drug resistance to to this anti TB drugs right yeah? so therefore they have to go another another type of a uh, treatment. Right, so normally, even though it's a, uh, you can be pure as uh, uh, what they call it cured, but normally in the ex chest X ray, you still have scars and cavity. Right, so this is the remain there, eh? because it's it's non reversible, eh? This kind of uh, uh, because the membrane will be hardened, things like that, so it's non reversible. All right, next is uh, lung cancer. So lung cancer is also coughing, fever, loss of weight, and loss of appetite. So these two. With the tuberculosis, you have to the same symptoms. Eh? So normally this one, uh, the, 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 to confirm, so normally you have the sputum smear test. Uh, it's normally coming up negative compared with TB. And then we have the chest x-ray and also the to confirm will be the tissue biopsy. But tissue biopsy is uh, quite quite difficult as uh, as my consultant, eh, uh, who is the lung transplant expert, you see, all this are near the trachea. So where is in between? What is in between your two lungs? Is your heart, right? So the heart is here. So for to get the lung biopsy, the tissue lung biopsy, uh, it's a very very uh, uh, tricky work for them to do because it's very dangerous. So to put a needle inside to poke in and get a sample, sometimes you know because the the, the patient is still alive and breathing in and out, in and out. So meaning the, there's movement of the lung, right? So sometimes, you know, or uh, uh, the doctor may poke in too much in the front. And also because there's a heart here, there's also the, all the main arteries. So around here. So therefore, you know, he can make, you know, poke one of the arteries and the patient may lead to death, right? Due to death. And it's quite, quite hard to, to, to control that. Right, so therefore, uh, normally, uh, uh, that's why for early detection is quite quite difficult for lung cancer. Eh? We do that, eh? because we cannot just simply do the tissue biopsy. All right, next. Uh, okay. All right, so this is the sample of the lung uh, X-rays uh, using the uh, chest X-ray. Right, so this is the uh, infected with pneumonia. It can affect anywhere, but normally based on lobes. Then uh, TB, normally TB will either, you know, closer to the wind pipe here, your airway. So either normally coming from the top part of the chest or it can be starting from the middle and below. And this is the lung cancer. So you see there's like a, a, a white, a fifth, uh, we call it a, 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 as large as our coin here, 50 cents coin. Yeah? So it's a white spot. Yeah? Right. And this is the normal lung. Okay. So why we choose chest X-ray? Of course, we have CT scans, but the thing is, uh, 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 it, it has been proven that chest X-ray is still useful in aiding medical doctors. Eh? Yeah, and then even though it's the paper is twenty years ago, but it's still valid until now. Plus, economic consideration, cheaper com compared to other modality. Even now, even Malaysia, in Malaysia, we have uh, uh, CT scans available in major hospital, but in the district hospital, uh, small clinics, a remote uh, remote clinic all have x-rays already right so it's easily available so malaysian hospital clinics district clinics and so on are equipped their chest x-ray machine and it's cost much much less and eh? so okay so what we did last time eh, we uh, used an andrews curve eh, to be uh, uh what we call with the, all the images uh for this one the sample and so we use andrews curve to to distinguish between the tb no, uh, normal lung and lung cancer, we can have that very, we can differentiate that very well. But when we put in pneumonia, this is the cases. So the pneumonia in the green curve is in between uh, the lung cancer and the uh, TB, 
eh, PTV. So hence, uh, it's difficult. But normal lung is okay. We can we can differentiate that. All right. Next, we do. Yeah, uh, this is a uh, wavelet texture measures and feature extraction. So this is uh, uh, the machine learning concept where we have a two D uh, of this. Uh, we have the uh, uh, data. All right, and then the region of interest and we transform it. Eh? So all this we take uh, the measures. So we have 12 texture measures here. Mean energy, entropy, contrast, and uh, many, many more variables. All right, uh, this is our discrimination strategy for to to, uh, to discriminate between this is present and this is absent uh, using the LDF and QDF. Eh? Uh, so this is our pairwise discrimination strategy because we have about uh, pneumonia, normal lung, TB, and lung cancer. So there are four. So this uh, we do two, two pairwise, two by two percent. So between pneumonia normal, TB normal, and lung cancer normal. All right. So what we get is quite good. Uh, so we have about 95 percent. Uh, uh, the rest we got 100 percent between the normal and TB, normal LC. And uh, but we get uh, about 95 percent between uh, normal and normal. All right, next is discrimination between uh, uh, the three diseases. Just now was normal, okay. Now the next the discrimination is between the pneumonia, TB, and LC, right? So we use uh, the this uh, also the same LDF QDF with the modified uh, principal component. So hence uh, we got a uh, quite uh, good results. Eh? So these are the classification results. All right, uh, so we have uh, uh, for TB, we can get about in total 96%, 0.67. All right, uh, this is for pneumonia, it's quite low, 70%. And uh, LC is also uh, low, 70.6%. Right, but we can detect the TB. All right, so hence uh, for uh, the for discrimination for between the disease absent and disease present, we've got about 100%. Uh, only for pneumonia, we got about 95%. And then uh, for discrimination, the three uh, class, uh, TC, pneumonia, and LC, are uh, using the pairwise uh, discrimination strategy. So for TB, we've got 96% accuracy, LC, we've got 78% uh, accuracy, and pneumonia, we've got 70% accuracy. All right, now comes next to the current work. Uh, I'm just started this one, uh, but this is uh, my. my collection uh, uh the literature review being done eh, to, to, uh, because the china they have uh, upper hand because they were uh, 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 infected earlier they have the problem much much earlier than us so they have more data and already published eh, lots of it so this is the COVID 19 virus uh so this is uh, this data is in june last year and uh, june last year june this year 2020 is about one month ago so fifth fifth june so at 5th June, we have about 6.6 .6 million total affected the whole world and about 391 deaths, eh? the global death, right? But then now today, today this, this data is today, which is uh, 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 this morning, I just took it from the John Hopkins scheme website. So today we have 11 million. So an increase of almost 4 million eh? in, a, in a one month, period, all right, for the total confirmed, and the death is up more than half a million, already, right, so an increase almost 200,000 death in one month period, just you, and we're not talking about cancer and so on, and the rest, uh, even the accident, the rest are, 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 are ongoing, but this is just due to the COVID, right, so it's, it's a little bit scary, yeah, so uh, that's why and now us eh, previously they were in about 1.8 million one month ago now they are 2.7 million right so it's an increase of 1 million uh, confirmed cases so the infection rate is high very very high and also the global death is very very scary okay so in malaysian scenario we are very lucky our our government has uh, conducted the mco strictly and we also very lucky. Thank you for the people of Malaysia. The people are very uh, uh, law-abiding citizens, so they follow. Eh? So they really follow. So hence, this is from 15 April until 3rd June, which is uh, 5th June, one month ago, uh, and today. 
So we are here. So that's why uh, 10 June, well, uh, uh, no more work from home, so we have to go to the office. Uh, school's not yet open, but there's some of businesses uh, already open slowly and slowly. And then our schools, uh, uh, I think uh, those who are uh, taking the examination eh, uh, before entering university, so they will already start classes. Oops. Okay, all right. Oh, what happened? All right, they already started their classes here. Uh, I'm, I'm still on, eh? so, sorry. I should, okay, I will make this quickly. So therefore we are uh, in the single digit. All right, so we still not zero, but we are in the single digit. All right, so the, the emergence of AI eh, for lung disease due to COVID-19, eh, uh, suddenly AI eh, for lung disease uh, getting the acceptance even from the medical profession, eh, medical practitioner. And before this, I've been trying to, to sell it to them, ha having a wall. Eh? uh in front of me so but now oh they openly open uh come uh accept and eh? now because they need it why because the ebon virus eh, compared to tb compared to other pneumonia and so on this ebon virus covid19 is able to spread rapidly then they tend to have a longer lifespan and can stick uh, for even to to person that, that do not have the symptoms and eh? they, they, they can may not have any symptoms at all and they can transfer up to five generations imagine yeah from say a has the uh, virus met b eh? close contact maybe shake hands and so on then b met c c shake hands c met d d shake hands with e so e can can get the infection and this is already proven for the malaysian scenario eh? Right, hence we have to have the minimum, minimum direct contact with COVID-19 patients is required. So all the doctors, all the frontliners, uh, so are all wearing the PPEs uh, covered themselves. Uh, all right, and then sadly, still no vaccine yet. And then hence, the, they need the fast and quick diagnosis required and the acceptance by the radiologist committee. So AI can provide more information like quantification and also the pattern of the virus spread or attack their respiratory organ, right? So utilization of CT scan and X-ray images. So both are there a lot, eh, depending on the country and depending on the hospital. So but in if you go uh, in the public database, more of X-ray images. Eh? Plus X-ray is more economical and portable. Because it can go to patients eh, with minimum contact rather than the CT scan, you have to bring the patient put inside there and then we'll scan. All right, so the AI role in the COVID 19 clinical decision. So we have the control infections, a eh, task for control uh, infection. So the function is to assess accurately and warm timely. Then we can. Madam, you have last five minutes. Okay, reduce burden and improve rapid evaluation efficiency. And then diagnose accurately, so accurately assess lesion and quantify segmentation. Then grading quantitatively, uh, multi-dimensional comprehensive analysis of lesions. So follow up dynamically, uh, compare the results of the multiple CT examination intelligently and analyze the result quantitatively. So this is roughly the component of AI-based uh, lung classification system. Of course, we have to do pre-processing. We have to do the segmentation to get the lung. Then we have to do the can candidate detection, where is the potential, eh? then the feature extraction and optimization. All right, so this is the additional components, eh? so we can do that. All right, so this is roughly uh, the, the CT imaging of features in 2019 of coronavirus. Eh? All right, so uh, eh, the of 21 patient with two, uh, 21 patients with COVID-19, 17.1% have involvement of more than two lobes, 57% 50, have, have uh, ground glass opacities, and 33% have opacity with rounded morphology. So this is how intense is in the COVID-19. So this day zero, so they scan, uh, this is from uh, uh, Min Yen, eh? so the profiling of the COVID-19. So this day zero here is the... C uh, the, the, the ground glass opacities. Then this is day three, you can see it's getting bigger. So this is day zero, this is one slice, this is another slice. Eh? The upper slice do not have anything. But when the day three, the third day, 
see how how fast it attacks and also now there is some parts of the upper lobe right so on the other lah so that's why uh, uh is uh, it scary yeah this covid 19 is scary so people will need to take this uh, seriously so this uh, radiographic patterns of covid 19 so this uh using the uh, chest x-ray uh, of course a uh, ct scan is you can see more but you need to uh, know them right so this is another chest x-ray between the day zero day four right so uh we need black uh, blackened means air right uh, but then day four is already full of white and day seven is even worse so that's why mostly uh the COVID-19 patient died eh, due to you cannot breathe eh? and also from if you have other complications like diabetes uh hypertension or heart problems so you make it worse right so this just uh, uh quickly go ai based segmentation normally they use unit is the most popular next is the unit plus plus and the vnet right uh so this is uh the similarity between the covid 19 and the capd uh, capd which is the community acquired pneumonia so it's not much different actually but it's just a matter of how far how rapid it attacks the lungs eh? so that is the difference right and then the, this is the summary imaging model modality so basically more 60 percent use ct 40 percent use x-ray and then now 86 percent using deep learning deep learning is a very powerful um, uh, machine learning uh, algorithm uh, that can do very fast and very accurate then 14 percent is using the uh, uh, machine learning traditional machine learning all right, so the task uh, normally 50 uh, percent will differentiate between covid 19 non-covid and 43 uh, between COVID-19 and other pneumonia. So the accuracy, uh, right, so quite high because of the deep learning, so majority got above 90%. Eh? And uh, there are others using about between 80 to 90%. All right, so roughly just uh, mentioned, this is our strategy eh, to the first stage uh, classification between abnormal and normal lung. Then the second stage will be the COVID-19 and between this uh, non-COVID, we, we try to get the other types of disease, right? So I think uh, this is roughly our results. Uh, so we got uh, still about 87.95%. So we need to increase to 90%. Eh? So we are still, uh, we uh, require more data. So more data is available now uh, com compared to when we uh, initially started. And also, we need to investigate using other type of deep learning, learning architecture, and also develop our own deep learning architecture. Right? And secondly, uh, this is ongoing now. We are handling on the cloud based using our cloud based system. Right. So roughly, this is my faculty. Uh, they look at it. Oh, you're welcome. So we have a nice view of the KLCC. Then we of signal processing. Uh, we are uh, 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 being granted to host. Uh, 2023 uh, ICM, International Conference on Image Processing Kuala Lumpur. So I do welcome everyone to come and join us. So this is our, our uh, another EMBS, uh, EBS. Uh, so supposedly to be in December, but we postponed it to March next year. All right, so I'll thank you very much for uh, the opportunity to uh, as a keynote speaker in this IEEE Connect 2020. So uh, I, as Superbody has mentioned earlier that I'm also one of the candidates for the Region 10 Director elect 2021-2022. Uh, so please do uh, cast your vote, eh? exercise your voting right, uh, it's starting from August 15 uh, to uh, uh, 1st October. So uh, Celia Shanas is also one of the candidates and so does Lance Park, right? So if you'd like to see my, uh, you can please go to my, website to see more information on myself and you can email me uh, using knowledge.gm.com right thank you very much i pass back to you for uh, questions yes thank you very much thank you very much for your insightful talk on the very uh, current topic so there will be many uh, queries and uh, this one so i just summarized all of them and i have put into one this one but can you just highlight on the aspect uh, the current the COVID-19, whether it is virus or bacteria, or it is affecting the lung, or it is the blood? Uh, okay. Do you have any idea? Yeah, that? okay. Uh, COVID-19 is, is virus. It's not bacteria. So uh, it is a virus. So actually, you cannot kill a virus. 
uh, that's that's what I've been told. So, but the 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 main uh, uh, the main uh, cry, uh, what they call characteristic of this uh, virus is through airborne. You know, they go, they can, they can be in anywhere, you know, on your body and so on. But the minute they touch human tissues, so that is when they attack. So that's why the corona, the word corona there. So the crown. Mm -hmm. So those crown will will attach themselves to the tissues, the human tissues. All right. So normally, uh, it will, it will, it is, it, 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 it would, it would want to be inside you, not, not outside, and eh? not on the cloth, not on the skin. As skin, we have a protection. Eh? Actually, our skin has a protection. So whatever uh, uh, bacteria outside cannot go inside through the skin, but they can go into our body through our nasal. The openings are nasals. So meaning that through the nose, when we breathe in. So when you breathe in, you bring, uh, if you, with the virus, so you will breathe in. So that's why they will attach to the uh, trachea or your airways. All right. Then it will make slowly it go inside and to attack your lungs. All right. So the, those visible, the visible characteristic that can be seen in the CT scan and also in the uh, uh, chest x-ray. Right, but the, the main concern is that's why we need the 14 days uh quarantine. Yeah, because uh from day one you suspected like you'll be in the airport or some uh, that's why like us uh for those Malaysian coming back uh from overseas need to be quarantined for 14 days, right? Uh because it can get affected anywhere. That's why uh, our border is still closed, no no tourists uh visitors coming from uh, outside Malaysia now. Not, not, it cannot come in yet. So meaning that once you step in Malaysia, you have to quarantine yourself for 14 days. There is no symptoms, no nothing, then meaning, and then of course they do the swab test twice. They do the swab test on the first day you arrive and also the 13th day, just before I finish the 14 days quarantine. So if both negative, then you are negative, All right? So that's why you, uh, the, the, the incubation of the virus is about 14 days. They can be active in you in about 14 days. All right. So if you don't have it, then there is they can, there is no attack. Nothing. That's why I say uh, yeah, the, the attacks from the lung uh, images, you know, if they attack you, you will got the symptoms plus and then that's why a uh, very short time uh, they, they attack you about, you know, set three days to seven days can be visible on your lung. You already have it. So the way you are being treated, I, since there is no uh, uh, vaccine yet, so for the Malaysian government, our Ministry of Health, the way they treat it, they treat it with the malaria uh, drugs. The drugs for malaria because uh, uh, to, to, to reduce the inflammation of the lung. So it works. So it reduces it. So uh, then uh, put, put the, uh, what do you call it, the, the patient in the, what do you call it, in the coma state so that it relax and so on. So. That, that's how how it been done in Malaysia. So other countries may may treat differently. So that's what that's that's why you know. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, thank you, madam. Uh, uh, we'll have to leave uh, from uh, you for now. Yes. Definitely, we'll try to connect you to our EMB chapters and constant chapter. They'll definitely be interested in uh, learning many things from you. Okay. And with this, uh, we conclude our. Uh, uh, session now we had a very illuminative talk from four different aspects of uh, activities of ICPE. I mean, it shows the breadth of the ICPE that uh, breadth of uh, technology or areas that ICPE covers really starting from uh, some uh, humanitarian aspects of this one to medical and some technology and how they are bridged together to help each other and try to build a better society and that is what we are all working for, and that is what is our all of our motto. So with this, we thank all the speakers uh, for their wonderful sessions and for the time that we could spare for all of us. And with this, I take leave of all of you, and then I will be joining SARP at 11 with a, a 15 minutes back. I request everybody to join back at five minutes, at least five minutes before the session. And there will be parallel sessions for uh, paper contributory paper presentations. So there is a uh, message in the chat window that you should be, if you are presenting a paper, you should be downloading the uh, WebEx uh, edition. 
app and from that you should be presenting not to webex uh, uh, means uh, direct from the link so please uh, see that message and take care of that aspect so that everything goes smooth and yeah. can we have uh, one now? photo yeah can we have one group photo yeah sure can we has uh, every second others can you switch on your video singapore Abhishek, please switch on your video. Abhishek was telling that he got disconnected somehow. I don't know that he got connected. Yeah. Yeah, Abhishek, please switch on your video. Yeah, that uh, maybe you can take the snap now. Maybe. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, so we'll everybody. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Hi. Bye, Celia. Bye. 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 Thank you.